So, my name is Rick Body. I'm a consultant in emergency medicine. I'm going to start off talking about uh, ECD uh, abnormalities and ECD findings. Um, this is one of my special interests. And ECGs are, are, are really good because this is a true skill. Um, and I think that's kind of unrecognised, really. You know, we think of um, things like practical procedures, like putting in a cannula or chest strings as skills. But ECG is, interpretation is a real skill. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And you can get loads of information from an ECG. Uh, not just the basics, you can get absolutely loads of information from a patient's ECG. We look at them all day long in emergency medicine, and it's really important that you're able to do it very well. Obviously, it's really important for your OSCE too, because you're not going to get through the exam if you can't. What we're going to do today is uh, talk about four things. We're going to go through the basics. Now, um, I think at fifth, at fifth year, you'll know a lot of the basics of the ECG. So I'm going to whiz, whiz through that and just give you a sort of whistle-stop tour through the ECG basics. Then, this is really important with your OSCE in mind. We're going to talk about a system for interpreting ECGs. Uh, and I have a system, that's what I'm going to teach you. You might have your own system, and that's absolutely fine. But what's really important is that you have a system for looking at ECGs. See, when you look at an ECG, you won't automatically, instantly recognise the pattern on every ECG and tell, be able to tell you the uh, abnormality straight away. But what's really important for the OSCE is that you can show that you can go through it systematically um, uh, and make some sense of it that way. Then we'll look at some ECGs. We'll look at some rhythm strips, some abnormal 12 leads, um, and that we'll talk about the sort of things that might come up in your ASCII. So here are the basics. Um, what is an ECG? Well, actually an ECG is just a sensitive voltmeter, and all you're plotting is voltage against time. It's a graph, basically. Um, and for every lead in that 12 lead ECG, you've got, you're looking at the difference between a positive electrode and a negative electrode every time. And if there's a positive deflection from the baseline, it means that the positive electrode has a more positive voltage than the negative one. It probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but this graph will help you to make a bit more sense of it. So this is this shows you sort of the, the cell surface, let's say. Okay? And you've got this positive charge this side and a negative charge this side. So you stick your negative electrode here and your positive electrode here. And when nothing's happening, no electrical activity is happening in that heart. You've just got this baseline, of course. And the reason is that there's no difference between what you're reading here and what you're reading here. No, look, it's all positive. There's no difference whatsoever. When the myocardium starts to depolarize, this, this wave sort of starts to spread across the myocardium, doesn't it? So now you've got positive charge on the inside, but negative charge here, and a positive charge all the way here. So now, this positive electrode is more, has a more positive voltage than this one. So you're starting to see a positive deflection. Okay? As this travels across, it gets to about here, and then it's going to peak, isn't it? As it gets all the way across, you, know, you get more than halfway across, the difference is less, because you've got, it's starting to go back towards normal again, until, basically, You've got no difference between the negative and the positive again, but that's because you've got negative charge here and negative charge here. So you've seen this. As, you, as your wave of depolarization has spread towards the positive electrode, you've had a positive deflection, and then as it comes back, and again, it's gone all the way across, and there's no difference between the negative and the positive electrode, you're back to the baseline. That's the very basics of an ECG. So as you're getting positive charge spreading towards a positive electrode, you're going to see a positive deflection, and vice versa. So if it was spreading away from the positive electrode, then you'd see a negative deflection. So let's say your negative electrode is here, and your positive electrode is here. If, the, if there was depolarization spreading that way, you'll see a positive deflection. It comes back to baseline. If the depolarization was spreading that way, you'd see a Q wave. QS way, wouldn't you? It'd be going down and then back up to the baseline. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the very basics of an ECG. Uh, this is a picture of the very first ECG machine. It's come a long way since then. Um, and if you wanted to get an ECG, then you had to stick your, 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 your foot in your arm in a big bucket full of water, of uh, salt water. Um, 
how do you record an ECG? Well, I'm going to go through that very briefly, because I think by fifth year, you've generally done a a recorded a few ECGs, right? I mean, you might have to do that in ASCII, so I thought that it would be useful just to recap about it. So, you've got your four limb electrodes, haven't you? Basically, you're setting up the electrodes between which you're going to measure those, those, those uh, voltage versus time graphs. So you've got your right one, red lead, the left, left one, the yellow lead, which going on the two shoulders, bony prominences. Then you've got the, the green electrode, uh, which is going green for spleen, somewhere down here. Uh, and then, or you could put that on the end call. We often put those on the, on the malleoli, don't we? The bony prominences. So you could put that on the, the medial malleolus of the left end call. And then your black electrode, which is the neutral. And that's not actually doing any measuring. That's just, your, it's just sort of your, just, just there to be a neutral electrode. And that's going on the medial malleolus of the right ankle. So then you've got four electrodes of those. Okay. Then you've got your chest leads. So you're going to put the V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6 across there. I guess you all know the landmarks, don't you? I'm going to recap very quickly uh, for those. So basically you're going to find the fourth intercostal space just next to the sternum for V1. And then for V2, you're going to find the fourth intercostal space just to the left of the sternum. The next one you're going to put is V4, which is going to be where about where your apex feet is. So fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. And then V3 is going to go in between V2 and V4. V5 and V6 are going to go on the same horizontal line as V4. But V5 is going to go in the anterior axillary line, and V6 is going to go in the mid axillary line. And that's your 12 lead ECG. <coughs> You're all happy about the, uh, how to record a 12 lead ECG. And this is what you get. So you've got um, six limb leads and six chest leads. And usually when we print out the report for ECGs, most ECG machines are set up to give us a little rhythm strip at the bottom as well. And conventionally, we normally put lead two as a rhythm strip. Uh, a few things we might want to uh, think about. First of all, the axis of the ECG. So when we talk about the axis, we can talk about the axis in any direction, couldn't we? But generally, when we, when we say the word axis, we're talking about the, the vertical axis as in the axis that we can look at from just the limb leads. Have you seen this diagram here? Um, this is telling us the direction in which uh, each lead is looking. And essentially, it's really telling us where the negative electrode is and where the positive electrode is. So for lead one, remember we've got a sticker here and a sticker here. For lead one, this is the negative electrode on your right shoulder. And this is your positive electrode on your left shoulder. And you're simply looking at that. So it's going straight across. And that's why that is what we call zero degrees straight across there. That's lead one. For lead two, now we're using the right shoulder still as our negative electrode. But suddenly we're now using the, we're taking the, the green lead, or we could say it's the medial malleolus of the left ankle, but the same as here, um, as, the, as the positive electrode. So we're looking at the electricity that's spreading that way, okay? That's lead two, and that's 60 degrees. So that's why lead two is in that direction, because we're looking at the travel of electricity between those two. And for lead three, now we're taking the, positive, the negative electrode as the left shoulder, and we're looking at the electricity spreading towards the green, which is here. So that is going approximately at 120 degrees, it's going in that direction. Okay? Dead simple. Um, one negative electrode, one positive electrode all the time. So that's your three, that's your leads one, two, and three of the elements. They're called the bipolar leads. But how do you measure ABR, ABL, and ABF? Well, the computer helps us with that. So what the computer does, the computer simulates an electrode, a negative electrode for ABR. So it takes the average of where the, the, the right shoulder electrode is and the green electrode, and it looks then at the, tra the travel of electricity towards the positive electrode at the left shoulder. And that means, so you take the average of there and there, you're somewhere here, aren't you? You're travelling up towards the left shoulder. Well, and that's why AVL is looking at minus 30 degrees. For AVF, 
you're looking ABF of the law. ABF, you're looking at the average of these two. So you're here, basically, aren't you? That's it. That's it. effectively what you're, what you're looking at. You're imagining the negative electrode is right here. And you're looking at the travel of electricity down towards the green electrode, which is roughly in the middle. So it's looking straight down. We call that 90 degrees. And for ABR, you're taking the average of these two, the left shoulder and the green. And you're looking at the electricity spreading up towards the right shoulder. So that's going not just straight to the right, but even further up. So that's where that diagram comes from. Does that make sense? Sometimes it helps to understand how these leads are being recorded in order to sort of make sense of uh, interpret the actual ECG when you see it. That's the sort of vertical axis, isn't it? But you've also got the leads that come out in a different, in a different way, the chest leads. They're looking horizontally, the electricity spreading out from the heart. So as a negative electrode, these are taking a kind of average of all of these which is somewhere around where the middle, of the, you know, middle of the body is, around the heart. And the positive electrode is where you strip the, the label on the chest. So V1 is coming out to the V1 lead, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. So that's going to help you. I've got a slide coming up later which shows where each lead is looking at in the heart. But it's kind of obvious when you think of it like this. So V1 to V3, they're your anterior leads, aren't they? And you can see that's because they're looking at the front part of the heart. V4 to 6 are your lateral leads. They're looking at the lateral part of the heart, because they're right over here. So knowing that helps you to understand what each lead is looking at and which area of the heart you're going to be um, seeing electricity from. So we call um, these augmented lead glenn leads, ABL, ABF and ABR, the unipolar leads, as well as the chest leads. They're also unipolar leads because we've uh, effectively not got a true negative electrode, we've had to sort of simulate it. And that's where this comes from. So what's the normal axis of the heart? Minus 30 to plus 90, yeah. So based on this, we know that the, the axis of the heart, the predominant depolarization wave, should be between the direction that ADL is looking at, minus 30, and 90 degrees, the direction where ADF is looking. Before we even started looking at an ECG, there are a couple of interesting features that you might have noticed. On the, sorry, you're going to handle Okay. Um, there are a couple of interesting features. There's this thing here. Does anyone know what that is? Calibration. Yeah, that's the calibration. So, um, what, do we look, what does that tell us? How do you interpret a calibration in an ECG? How do you know if it's properly calibrated? Yes, exactly. So um, the, the reason it goes up 10 is because it's 10 millimetres per millivolt, which is the standard setting for the ECG machine. And it'll always say that at the bottom of your ECG machine. So if you want to sound really clever in your ASCII when you're going through the ECG, before you even get to interpreting it, you say this is a standard 12 lead ECG. I can see that it's calibrated 10 millimetres per millivolt. I'm checking the calibration curve. You can see that that measures 10 millimetres across and 5, ten, 5 millimetres across and 10 millimetres up. That shows that it's properly calibrated. And then you've got the speed as well. So 25 millimetres per second is the usual speed that we might look at. Um, it's really good to get into the habit of looking for that because there are some signs when the ECG machines might have been set differently. For example, to 50 millimetres per second. You know when we might use, someone might set the ECG machine to 50 millimetres per second? If you've got a tachycardia, someone's really tachycardic, and you're really having difficulty interpreting what might be the cause of that tachycardia, sometimes it helps to actually effectively slow it down on here to get yourself more space in between the complexes and see what's going on. If someone might change that to 50 millimetres per second to interpret a really fast tachycardia, but if they do that and forget to change it back, then it's going to make your ECG uh, look, look different. And obviously you might then think that the QRS complex is broad when it's not, so you might think that the heart rate is slower than it actually is. 
Um, so that's really important. So if you were going to start talking about your ECG, you mentioned it's 12 week ECG, you mentioned it's properly calibrated, and you mentioned that it's going 25 millimeters per second, which is the appropriate speed. So here's my system, how to read an ECG. And effectively, I've broken it up into six things. There are um, six things to do with the rhythm strip and six things to do with the main ECG. So obviously, the first thing that you're going to do when you're present, asked to present an ECG in an OSCE is to tell you who the patient is. So I'm checking the patient. This is John Smith, uh, date of birth, 1st of the 1st, 1910. Um, it shows that you've checked that it's the right ECG. Then, I talk about the indication. Um, now, you might not have that information in OSCE all of the time. But it's very useful to know the indication. I would never look at an ECG without, without finding out why it's being recorded. Because that really is going to influence how you interpret it. If you're looking at the ECG of somebody with acute chest pain, you're going to be thinking of diagnoses that are very different to somebody who might have gone to their GP for a routine appointment and be having a, a routine screening ECG, for example. If you see ST elevation in someone with acute chest pain, well, you're really thinking that might be a myocardial infarction. Whereas in someone who's sat up... In a GP surgery, having a routine checkup, ST elevation is far less likely to be a myocardial infarction. So you really need to know a bit about the clinical context, what's the indication for the ECG. So patient details and indication. And then, when you come to actually look at the ECG, talk about the type of the ECG. So it will almost always be a 12 lead ECG. You could have a 3 lead ECG just to assess the rhythm. You could have just a rhythm strip printed off from the DFib. Um, but it's important, whatever you get, to talk about the type of ECG. Are there any other types of ECG that you might, uh, you might see? Other than the 12 lead, 3 lead, and simple rhythm strip? Stress ECGs. Stress ECG, you definitely won't get that for an OSCE. <laughs> uh, but you're right, yes. A, a stress, so a stress ECG is, we might see a series of 12 lead ECGs for, for, for that. Anything else? Posterior leads. Yeah, so a posterior lead. So you might get a 15 lead ECG, where the extra three leads are posterior leads. Um, has anyone look, looked at a posterior lead ECG? Do you know how to record it? So, we could also talk about when to record it. So, the only real indication for doing posterior leads is in somebody with a suspected myocardial infarction, so acute chest pain. And we might see ST depression in the anterior leads, and you might think that that could be a posterior infarction, because you, with the infarction being in the back of the heart, you might see ST depression when you're looking at the front, rather than elevation. So you need to put some leads around the back to see if there's really ST elevation there. And those extra three leads are chest leads, just like these, these one to six. All you're going to do, you've probably only got six um, wires for the chest leads, so you're going to take V4 to six up. You're going to put extra sticky labels on them. So just like B5 and 6 are in the same horizontal line, you're going to carry on in that horizontal line, but go around the back. And V5 and 6 are in two landmarks, aren't they? They're in the anterior axillary line and the mid axillary line. Well, the posterior leads are the same. You need to put them on landmarks. And there are only three landmarks that I could possibly think of that you might possibly put them on going around the back. The first one, as you're going around for V7, is the posterior axillary line. So you're going to stick V7 in there. V8 is the next landmark, and that's the tip of the scapula. And then the only next landmark you're going to get is the edge of the vertebrae, and that's why you put V9. So there are three landmarks on the surface. You stick a lead on each of them in the same horizontal line as V6, and it's that simple. V7 to V9 are posterior leads. Uh, and then you have a 15 lead ECG. Sometimes you get an 18 lead ECG. You know what the extra three leads are in that context? The right side of the leads. So we, are, we don't look particularly at the right side, do we? There's only two leads that look at the right side of the heart. That's AVR, that's looking right up here, and uh, V1, but that's looking here, it's pretty much anterior. Sometimes patients might be having a right-sided myocardial infarction, and you want to know about that. You know why it's important? I don't know why picking up a right-sided infarction is important. Um, Potentially, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, it affects the artery, it affects the uh, sinoatrial nerve, and it's the right primary artery. So, um, you, you, might, you might get a right ventricular infarction in someone who's got an inferior MI, for example. 
But we should we normally record them as people who've got an inferior myocardial infarction to see if the infarction spreads as far as the right ventricle. When you have an inferior MI, some patients will be hypotensive. And there are lots of reasons for that. One is that you might have sinoatrial mode involvement. One is that they might be in cardiogenic shock. But one is that they might be having a right ventricular infarction, in which case they're going to need a high preload to increase their blood pressure. So actually, picking up a right ventricular infarction in those patients means that you can then confidently give them a little fluid bolus, perhaps 500 mils of saline, and the blood pressure is likely to respond. So we would do V4 to 6 on the right, RV4, RV5, and RV6, in the same place as you do V4 to 6 on the left, but on the right side. And they're called your right ventricular leads. And again, you'd be looking for ST elevation to pick up a right side of the infarction. So that's the type of ECG. So we've looked at patient details, indication, type of ECG. Now we'll look at the rhythm strip. So normally loop two is printed out at the bottom of the rhythm strip. And I'm going to come back to the rhythm strip because I've got a system for looking at rhythm strips as well. Having looked at the rhythm and identified what rhythm we're in and what rate it's going at, we'll look at the axis. And again, we'll go through the axis in a few minutes. And then lastly, number six, go through each lead on a 12 lead ECG. Now when you've looked at enough, it's pattern recognition. You look at an ECG and straight away you'll say, yeah, that's an anterior MR, yeah. that's atrial fibrillation, that's LVH. Pattern recognition. But that comes from looking at loads and loads and loads of ECGs. And if you don't know what's going on, or if you're just starting out, it's really important to go through each lead systematically and know what each lead is supposed to generally look like in the minority. So we'll go through that again in a little bit more detail. Those are the six things. Six things to look at the ECG. Patient details, indication, type of ECG, rhythm strip axis, and then going through each lead. When we look through the rhythm strip, I have a system. And this is the one that uh, we teach on advanced life support courses. I think it's quite a good one. Again, you ask six simple questions. And this will really help you to identify any rhythm really. The first question, is there any electrical activity? If there's not, you'll be pretty worried. Um, but it's, it, you know, you'll only be checking the leads and you'll be wanting to know if the patient's in a system, won't you? <coughs> Number two, what's the ventricular rate? How do you look at, how do you work out the ventricular rate? Well, it's 300 divided by a big Yeah, that's the most common one. So you count the number of the, the big squares in between two QRS complexes and you divide, it's 300 divided by that number, isn't it? We'll get you a rough rate, yeah, okay. Um, what about if there uh, is an irregular rhythm? A number of our waves in? Yeah, so you've got, so you're going to go for a six centimetre, six centimetre strip? Yeah. Like a block? Yeah. So, yeah, that's one way of doing it, isn't it? So you're going to work out, for example, you can look at one second of, um, you can, it, it varies, you might, everyone will look at di different things, but you might look at one second worth of ECG complexes, count how many there are, times it by 60, you might look at six seconds worth, just think of what your, your method is, and then times it by 10, that's probably quite an easy way. Um, but those are, the, those are the sorts of ways, aren't they? Um, yeah, so that's, a, that's quite a good one. Has anyone used that one? Work out six seconds worth of ECG strip, Count the complexes, times it by 10, and put your rates. Okay, so once we've, once we've worked out the rate, we want to know is it regular or irregular? Um, if regular, it's obvious. If it's irregular, there's another question we want to know what's that? Uh, even before we get to the P waves, is it, it's about the type of irregularity. Is it regularly irregular or irregularly irregular? And regularly irregular means that there's some kind of pattern to it. We can, it's irregular, but you know, we can predict when these irregularities might happen. Irregular, irregular means there's absolutely no pattern to it whatsoever. You can't predict when the next beat's going to come. We then want to know whether the QRS complex is nano or broad. That's quite important, isn't it? Because uh, you know, if it's nano, it's suspect, it suggests that the beat is being conducted from the atria and through the appropriate channels and the appropriate conducting system. Whereas if it's broad, it suggests that either it's coming from the atria or there's a, there's a fault in the... Um, uh, conducting system in the ventricles, so you've got a bundle branch block, or 
the, the bee's not being conducted from the atria at all, and there's a ventricular origin for this. For this. So in the bradycardia, the broad complex might get you thinking about a complete heart block, for example. In a tachycardia, a narrow complex gets you thinking about an SVT or an atrial fibrillation, whereas a broad complex gets you thinking about a VT. Is there any atrial activity is the next thing? So that's where your P waves come in. Um, and you might see P waves, you might just see sort of a regular fluttering baseline, and um, it's totally irregular and chaotic at the baseline, you might be thinking of atrial fibrillation. But when you look at the atrial activity, it's important also to describe it. And then talk about how the atrial activity is related to the ventricular activity. So is there, if there are P waves, is every P wave followed by a QRS complex, or are some of them dropped? And is the PR interval constant? Is there any association at all between the P waves and the QRS complexes? So with those six questions, I think you can get to the bottom of virtually every single rhythm. We also want to look at the intervals when we're looking at the rhythm strip. So there are some, some intervals that we really need to know about. First one is obviously the PR interval. You know what the normal PR interval is? Three to five small squares, yeah. So that's uh, 0 0.12 to 0.2 seconds, or three to five small squares. And you measure that from the start of the P wave to the start of the QRS. When you measure all the intervals, you're always starting at the start of something to the start of something, or the end of something. It's very difficult, you start, you never start at, you never start at the end of something, if you know what I mean. So the PR interval is the start of the P wave where you start, to the start of the QRS complex. For the QRS complex, the normal width, I'm sure you all know, is less than three small squares, or less than 0.12 seconds. Sometimes when you're looking at the QRS complex, you have to look at different leads on the ECG, because it looks narrow in some leads, but then when you look at certain leads, you, you, you identify that it's broad. So actually look at all of the leads on the 12 lead ECG and measure it at the, what appears to be the broadest. And then lastly, you've got your QT interval. Um, and you start that at the start of the Q wave, and that goes to the end of the T wave. And normal variant, it varies with your heart rate, so you have to report a correct QT, the computer will report that. But normal will be somewhere below about 450 milliseconds. So you count all your intervals, and that's uh, I, I need to set you already assessed your rhythm. So here are some rhythm strips that we can go through uh, to look at. So what do you think about this one? How about that? Have a little think about, about that one to yourselves. And let's go through it. So let's go through those six questions. There's clearly some electrical activity, isn't there? Um, what's the QRS rate? Fairly slow, isn't it? Um, I don't know what. We could count, like you said, six seconds worth and times it by ten, or we could just roughly go one, two, three, four, and a bit uh, between two. So 300 divided by four and a bit. 70 ish. Okay, so we've got a QRS rate that's going about that. Um, next is the QRS duration, narrow or broad? Probably quite narrow, isn't it? It's less than three small squares. Okay. So then we're going to ask: um, Is there any atrial activity? There's atrial activity in the P waves, aren't there? Yeah. And how is the atrial activity related to the ventricular activity? Well, <coughs> you've got a P wave and then a QRS complex here, haven't you? And again there, and again there. But what's the PR interval doing? It's quite long here, isn't it? It's already quite long there. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, and a bit small squares. Uh, on this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, ooh, seven or eight small squares. This one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and a bit small squares. Um, and then here, you've got a P wave and no QRS complex whatsoever. So, what do you think that might be? So, yeah, great. So, it's so a second degree heart block. The reason it's second degree heart block is we know we've got a prolonged PR interval. That would be first degree heart block. But it becomes second degree heart block because you're starting to miss some beats. When you're starting to miss beats, it's more than first degree, it's second degree heart block. So, then we've got to differentiate between the two types of second degree heart block. Is it type 1, as in Benkebach, or is it type 2, Mobitz type 2 heart block, in which case 
And there's a fixed PR interval, but some beats are dropped. In the Benke pack, the PR interval gradually lengthens until eventually you miss a beat and then you start again. So that's secondary heart block, Mobitz type 1, or Benke pack. And that's slightly less significant than a Mobitz type 2. In fact, some athletes have that. Um, one of our consultants, who's a really keen cyclist, came into uh, to work one day with um, some palpitations, so recorded an ECG, and we found he had uh, uh, Benke back on the ECG. So he proudly showed it to all, as all showed it, because Benke back, Benke back. You know, athletes get this. <laughs> <laughs> so here we've got another ECG from at Ribbon and Strip, okay? Let's go through those questions again. Um, so, um, is there any electrical activity? Well, there clearly is, isn't there? Um, what's the QRS rate? Well, we have to work that out because it's clearly uh, irregular, isn't it? Um, it's, uh, so we have to work that out like you did for the six seconds and the time it took. But um, assuming we've done that, I mean, probably the average, I would say, is probably about 60. But we'd have to do that over a longer strip in an ASCII to work out the rates. Is it regular or irregular? Clearly irregular. Is it regularly irregular or irregularly irregular? Well, with this one, it's reg regularly irregular, isn't it? Because there's a pattern. You've got two beats and then a miss. Two beats and then carry on as a miss. Um, so there's a kind of pattern there. So it's regularly irregular. We're not thinking of atrial fibrillation. We're thinking of other things as regularly irregular. Things like heart rate. Um, okay. Is there any atrial activity? Yeah. There's definitely atrial activity, isn't there? It's EP rates. And how is the atrial activity related to the ventricular activity? Well, you've got a P wave and a QRS here. You've got a P wave and no QRS here. You've got a P wave and a QRS here. Good PR interval. And again, same PR interval. Nothing, nothing. Then a P wave QRS and decent PR interval and a decent PR interval. So you've got, okay, it's conducting at times with an all right PR interval. And then it's missing some. So what does that make it? So it's tempting to think it could be a complete heart block because of the broad QRS complex, isn't it? And you might think that's a ventricular origin. But with complete heart block, you're going to have complete dissociation between the atria and the ventricles. No relationship whatsoever. Whereas with this, you've got these beats that are definitely being conducted. So it's a type 2 heart block. So type 2 means that you're just missing some beats. You've got conduction, but you're missing some beats. And in this one, so when you say, when you say second degree heart block, is it Mobix type 1 or Mobix type 2? It's not Mobix type 1, because you've only got this lengthening PR interval followed by MSB. It's the other one, it's Mobix type 2. And that's a bit more significant. That's got a higher risk of being, uh, of being quite aggressive and causing things like asystole. So you'd be a bit more worried about this. Sometimes you can describe the pattern of Mobitz type 2 heart block, can't you? You can say it's 2 to 1 and 3 to 1 block, and there's a definite pattern. But with this, it's slightly more erratic, isn't it? And that tends to be the, the, the what happens in clinical practice. So here we've got another one. Uh, and in this one, we've got electrical activity, but a very slow rate, haven't we? Without working it out, that's definitely very, very cardiac. We've got a narrow QRS complex. Um, we've got atrial activity, P wave here, you can definitely see a P wave here, definitely here, 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 here. How is it related to the ventricular activity though? That's the, going to be the, the, um, the key to this, isn't it? So here we've got a P wave, no QRS whatsoever, and this QRS just comes out of the blue. Here we've got a P wave, and a QRS does follow it. Uh, here we've got a P wave and nothing. Here we've got a P wave right in the middle of that. <coughs> Here we've got a P wave and nothing. Here we've got a P wave right on top of the T wave. What do you think? So there's no relationship in this one at all. By coincidence, you'll always get the occasional one that happens just before the QRS complex. But that's coincidence. If you were to get a piece of paper and mark P waves out, that you see, if you, and run it across, you'll see a regular pattern of, of P waves, and you'll probably see one buried in that T wave there. But you've got a regular pattern of P waves. And then if you mark the QRS complexes, you'll see a regular pattern of QRS complexes all the way, going at different rates. The two independent rhythms, they're just working completely independent of the atrial ventricles, and that's complete heart block. 
It's a little unusual because you've got this narrow QRS complex. You'd normally have a broad QRS complex that's coming from the ventricles rather than the atria. But it might be that this escape rhythm has been generated from the bundle of Hiss, and that's why you get a narrow complex. So a complete heart block, you'd really worry, wouldn't you? you we'd be thinking that this patient might be unstable, we might need, uh, we might need to pry atrophy, it doesn't often work in complete heart block, and we might need to get them paced urgently. This rhythm is a spot diagnosis. So this is BS. If you only know one ECG rhythm, this is probably the ECG rhythm to know. <laughs> Completely chaotic uh, BF. If you see that, well, your patient ought to, be, ought to be dead, and you ought to be starting CPR and getting them defibrillated as soon as possible. It's totally chaotic, no pattern to it whatsoever. Now, this one's not BF. This one looks pretty scary. It's got broad complexes and very broad complexes. But you can see it's twisting. You see the twisting? Does anyone know what that is? Spot diagnosis? Tussards. That's Tussards. And you treat that with a load of magnesium for patient alcoholics. Okay, how about this one? AF, yeah, so a spot diagnosis for this one, isn't it? Um, why, why is it AF? What makes it AF? Yeah, not, uh, what else could you do in a regular, irregular rhythm um, with, with, with decent QRS complexes like this? It's totally irregular, irregular. So that's atrial fibrillation. Um, with, with, yeah, with ventricular ectopics, you've got, you'll have an inherently regular rhythm, and then to the heartbeat that's that's missed. So, you, so it, that's regularly regular because you've got this basically regular rhythm, and then you have one that's, that, 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 that jumps out. And whereas with this, it's just totally, there's absolutely no pattern. You could put a piece of paper on there and mark it, and there wouldn't be any pattern whatsoever in atrial fibrillation. How about this one? Yeah, atrial flutter. So what makes what makes it atrial flutter? Yes, can everyone see, everyone happy with the sawtooth pattern of the P waves? Uh, so that, that's absolutely characteristic of, a, of an atrial flutter. No, common misconception about atrial flutter, the people, atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter are very similar, they treat them very similarly. But people think that atrial flutter is irregularly irregular. It doesn't, it doesn't tend to be. Atrial flutter is usually a regular rhythm. Uh, and what's happening is, you've got this flutter wave circling around the atria, about 300 beats per minute. And every now and then it'll conduct. But it tends to be fairly predictable about when it's going to conduct. It depends on your conducting system, how healthy it is, and how, how, you know, how much adrenaline is in your system, about how it, how it will conduct. And if you, it will never go up one to one, because your ventricles can't quite keep up with a 300 beat per minute rhythm. But if you go up two to one, you could get a 150 beat per minute narrow complex tacky with atrial flutter. Or it could go at, let's say, 75, four to one, um, or if you go at 3 to 1, about 100. And that's what you've got here. So you've got the flutter waves, which go at 300 beats per minute roughly, all at the consistent rate. You've got this sawtooth pattern, which is just there. And there's one under here that will be buried under there. It'll be buried there and there. And what you can see is 1, 2, 3, 4. Every fourth one is conducting. 1, 2, 3. Okay, you've got 3 there. 1, 2, 3, 3. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. See, it's a three to one pattern, and that's going about 100 beats per minute. But this is it. the atrial flutter has these characteristic sore tooth waves and a predictable pattern. Um, when it's going at 150 beats per minute, it's two to one block. It's sometimes quite hard to see these uh, sore tooth waves because they're buried in the T waves. So if you see a narrow complex tachy going at 150 beats per minute, atrial flutter should always be in your differential. And sometimes if you give those patients a Denisy, or you're trying to slow the heart rate down with a vagal maneuver, you suddenly, when the heart rate slows down, you just see this nice pattern of sore tooth waves going along, and you nail the diagnosis of atrial flutter. Not cure it, but you, you nail the diagnosis. So how about this one? So here, what you've got is you've got narrow QRS complexes, haven't you? But the rate is very fast, and it's going at what? Well, just over one small square, really fast rhythm. 
probably about maybe two and a bit per minute. And it's regular, it's a regular rhythm. So you've got a regular, narrow, complex tachycardia. If you, were, if you have that in an ASCII, you go through those six questions, um, and you probably won't be able to say you've got any evidence of atrial activity, you can't see it there. But then you summarise, you get to the end of the six questions, you say, so in summary, what I've got here is a narrow, complex tachycardia, which is regular. So uh, no evidence of sore tooth waves. What's any di differential for this? What do you think that might be? SVT, yeah, so a junctional tachycardia, where you've got a little defect in the AV, AV node or just next to it, and you've got a re-entering tachycardia going around and around, and it's regular narrow complex tachycardia. And that's what it is, this is an SVT. Uh, and these patients might respond to a denosine or a vagal manoeuvre, like carotid sinus massage or a valve salve manoeuvre. Have you ever seen, uh, have, you, have you ever worked in the PED in children's? Have you seen any SVTs in, in babies or children? We get quite a few of those at the children's hospital. And um, we can, one way that we can revert those is actually by using what's called a diving reflex. You have a diving reflex. It doesn't want to cold water. Yeah, exactly. So um, you have to get the parent's confidence in what you're doing. But um, we, we basically dump the head into cold water, and it gives them a strong vagal stimulus. And often, uh, the SVT stops without you having to give them any drugs. So that's the rhythm strip. Let's have a quick look at the axis. There are two ways to work out the axis. There's the easy way and the hard way. I'm only going to go through the easy way. So, for the easy way, all you've got to do is the rule called the rule of thumbs. Imagine your left thumb is lead one and your right thumb is lead two. Now, uh, all you're going to do is if, if lead one is positive, you're going to put your left thumb up. If lead one's negative, you're going to put your left thumb down. Same with lead two, up or down, depending on whether the QRS complex is going more up than down or more down than up, okay? So, in this one, lead one is mainly going upwards, lead two is mainly going upwards, it's a normal axis. In this one, lead one is, well, it's just at the borderline end but kind of mainly going down. So, lead one is mainly down, and lead two is up. So, that makes it right axis deviation. Okay. You have to, the, the, the thing to remember is that the one with the thumb up is the one with the, is where it's going towards that right axis deviation when your thumb your right thumbs up. If lead one is mainly upright and lead two is mainly downwards, it's abnormal and it's left axis deviation. Okay. If both thumbs are down, then it's a really bizarre axis. And you're going to have to use the hard way to work out exactly what's going on. <laughs> Fortunately, those are pretty rare. And in this ECG, which I've got an example of here, there's a reason why that's such a bizarre axis. Can you see it? It's paced, yeah. So you've got a pacing spike for the QRS complexes. So the, the rhythm's coming from the ventricle, so of course it's going upwards. And that's why it's a bizarre axis. But uh, you, you very rarely need to use that. Only you can, only it's, and it's enough to say it's an extreme axis if both thumbs are going down. For your ask it, the rule of thumbs will actually get you through. A uh, quick recap of where the leads of the... Uh, so this is now looking at the 12 lead ECG, okay? We're going to quickly run through those just to finish up. We're going to look at where the leads are looking at, first of all. So you've got the inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF. Remember... Um, lead 2 is going down here, isn't it? From there to there. Lead 3 is going from there to there. And lead AVF is the average of these two, looking towards the floor, looking straight down. So there you're in failure leads. Your lateral leads are V5 and 6, so your chest leads out here. And also 1 and AVL, because 1 is looking straight across from there to there. And AVL is looking from every of those two up to there. So that's looking laterally as well. And that's really important to remember, these two as lateral leads, actually. Um, they're what we call the high lateral leads. They're looking a lot higher than these leads down here. So sometimes you might get a patient with a high lateral MI, and it only shows ST elevation in those two. And that's one of the most commonly missed MIs, actually. Your anterior leads are obviously the chest leads that are where well, you've stuck the labels at the front, V1 to 4. And your right-sided leads, well, you've only really got AVR. V1 is just looking slightly to the right of the midline, and, uh, and AVR is looking 
upwards as well. So if you really want right-sided leads, you've got to add those extra leads in. And there's the diagram, just as a reminder. Let's have a quick look at some ECGs. Start off with a normal ECG. In a mask, you're going to say, OK, I've got an ECG here. This is Joe Bloggs, state of birth, 1, 1, 18, 10. And I can see that this ECG was recorded because he had a routine checkup at his GP surgery. Um, the, we are going to say it's a standard 12 lead ECG. We've got a lead 2 rhythm strip at the bottom here. It's appropriately calibrated. We've got calibration here. Oh, he has it the far side there. And it's 25 millimeters per second. So a type of ECG. We're going to look then at the um, rhythm. So we're going to look at lead 2. And if we want to go through those six questions, we're going to. But we could just say, if we're happy, it's normal sinus rhythm. Going at a rate of whatever it is, 75 feet per minute. Uh, and then we're going to look at the axis of the halot. Both thumbs are up, so it's a normal axis. So we've got a normal axis, and then we're going to go through the leads of the, leads of the 12 lead ECG. And so, systematically going through each of the leads, we can see normal morphology. And this is where it's important to look at loads of ECGs, and you've, got to, you've just got to do that to be able to look at them properly. But, you know, generally, you're always going to see an upright peak, your ST, except in certain leads, um, and that's what you get in most of these. You know, and you're going to look at the ST segment, you can look at the shape and size of the T wave. Um, we'll comment on the intervals, we might have done that during the rhythm. Uh, and we're going to go right away across systematically through each lead and see if it's normal. You might spot some obvious patterns. And it's okay then to say the obvious abnormality on this ECG is the patient's in VF or whatever. It's okay to comment on the, the, the obvious abnormalities. But you've really got to recognise the characteristic patterns in each lead, like for example ABR, which is completely upside down, and where you'll get T inversion, like V1. So that's a normal ECG. Having systematically gone through each lead, you can say this is a normal 12 lead ECG. Here's another ECG. Now we're not got time to go through them all systematically. This is an obvious uh, abnormality checker. So what do you see on this ECG? ST elevation, yeah. So when you're describing that ST elevation, you want to describe where it is. So if you're going to describe that ST elevation very briefly in a summary, you would say, I see ST elevation in B2, B3, B4, B5, B6, yeah? And the two leads that everyone forgets to look at, one and ADL. And those are the anterior leads, and the lateral leads. Plus, if you went through each lead systematically, you'll also notice that you've got ST depression in these two leads. And in the context of someone with chest pain, what do you think that, that's showing? Antrolateral MI, yeah. So that's how you summarize it. So I see ST elevation in the antrolateral leads, V2 to 6, 1 and ADL, with reciprocal ST depression in the inferior leads. I think this patient is having an antrolateral myocardial infarction. Happy with that? They're not always so obvious, are they, the, uh, the MIs that you see? What do you see on this ECG? Yeah, so here you've got ST elevation in 2, 3, and ABF. And this isn't quite as obvious, this is much more admissible. Sometimes you have to look through each lead systematically to notice that and count the ST elevation. You need one millimetre in two limb leads, or two millimetres in two chest leads to diagnose an MI, don't you? Uh, and you've definitely got that in these inferior leads. This is an inferior MI, so the ST elevation in 2, 3, and ABF of the inferior leads. And you've got the reciprocal ST depression again in ABF. If you, if you see that reciprocal ST depression, it makes it much more likely that it's an MI that you're seeing. Um, I'll put this slide in just to talk about briefly where you measure ST elevation. Um, I think it's slightly less important at, uh, at, at your level, but I wouldn't... So people get very hung up about whether you should measure it here, what's called the J point, just where the ST segment begins, here, here, whereabouts on there do you measure it? Um, now, it's not going to bother you for your OSCE, because the stuff you're going to see is going to be pretty obvious. You're going to see obvious stuff in your OSCE, and it's enough to say that there's ST elevation that meets the criteria. But what I would rely on more this is a practical point for your practice. Pattern recognition. I wouldn't get so hung up on which point exactly you measure it. It's looking at the pattern, seeing so many ECGs, that you recognise that the shape of that ST elevation is definitely an LI and not high takeoff. 
that's much more important than actually um, counting that now. But I think that's something that you'll come across a lot. Um, now here I've got an ECG. I just wanted to quickly show you that not all ST elevation is a myocardial infarction. And this ECG, you can see that there's ST elevation in these two. Um, there's ST elevation a little bit in ADF. There's ST elevation in all of these leads across here. And this is what I was talking about with regard to the shape of the ST elevation there. So this might be a patient with chest pain to come into the emergency department. Well, it was. Um, but this isn't an MI. And the reason you can tell that is the shape of the ST elevation. Look, it's particularly here. It's like a saddle, concave up, yeah? Now, you often get that with, for example, a high taper, or, characteristically, pericarditis. Yeah, and this is a classical ECG from someone with pericarditis. Sometimes the PR segment is depressed, maybe a little bit depressed here. But classically, you've got widespread saddle shaped ST elevation in pericarditis. Um, just wanted to finish on this one, um, which shows deep ST depression in these anterior leads from the V1 to 3. And I mentioned about the 15 week ECG earlier, the posterior uh, MRI. If you saw a patient with chest pain who had ST depression here, it could be that they've got anterior ischemia, but it could be that it's posterior MRI. So this pet is a patient where you definitely measure, uh, record the posterior leads to see if there's any ST elevation on the back for a posterior MRI. And that is a posterior MRI, that ECG. Um, but one minute ago, to talk about this. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I'm conscious I've run a little bit over. I wanted to very briefly talk about bundle branch block because people get very confused about bundle branch block. Okay. Now you've got this is a rhythm strip. You look at this and you say it's normal science rhythm. Okay. But you've got broad QRS complexes, it's more than three small squares. So in that context, a broad QRS complex with a normal science rhythm, you know it's going to have to be a bundle branch block. What you want to know, is it left or is it right? A dead easy way of knowing, okay? Look at V1. Is it going all the way down, like that? If it is, then it's left bundle branch block. It's that simple. Um, people talk about William Merrow, yeah? The W pattern in V1 and the um, M pattern in V6. Really, the left bundle branch block, you always get this in V1. And in right bundle branch block, you look at V1, and you'll get the RSR pattern for this kind of thing, for them going upwards. That's right bundle branch block. The same thing, normal sinus rhythm, broad QRS complex, and thinking of a bundle branch block, is it right or left? Look at V1, and this one's going more upwards, and it's not going straight down like a, like a left bundle branch block. That's a right bundle branch block. Okay? And that's it. I'm a bit over time, so I'm sorry for going over time. Thanks.